Okay, uh, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. It's nice and a, a little bit terrifying to be to such, come to such a big conference to present the talk. Uh, I'm here to talk about I'm here to talk about uh, Gen GPU enhanced neural networks, which is a, a graphics accelerated neural networks frame, software framework. Uh, my name is James Turner. I'm a PhD student of uh, Thomas Novotny, and I work with Thomas and uh, Essenivas on Gen. Okay, uh, first things first, so why, why not single core? Why not C, uh, CPU neural network simulations? Well, uh, we've, there's only so much you can accelerate a single core before. There's only so fast you can make a single uh, processor core. Uh, so the solution, as we've already heard uh, earlier today, a lot of people are adopting uh, graphics processing units because of uh, they have a, a lot more cores than uh, central processing units. Uh, the good thing about GPUs is that, um, thanks to the, the video game industry, uh, um, there's a lot of bang for your buck. Uh, it's driven by a very big market. And thanks to that, you've got very high performance chips. Okay, uh, so the good thing about GPUs is that you can get very large uh, network simulations uh, at real-time performance. However, it can be quite hard to program these uh, simulations. Um, so with GPUs, it's a non-trivial problem uh, to ensure that all resources on the graphics card are used 100% of the time. Uh, because uh, GPUs are optimized for throughput rather than latency as well, uh, memory operations are quite expensive. So that's another thing you have to worry about and program around. So the typical user doesn't care about this stuff. Uh, neural networks is all they care about. So enter GPU enhanced neural networks. It's a C++ source library for uh, and generating GPU code for neural networks. Uh, it uses a code generation approach. I'll get onto the advantages of that. Um, it's fast, flexible, and as I'll hopefully show in the few, next few slides, easy to use. Uh, and it's open source and it's cross-platform. It's available in Mac, OS X, and Linux, uh, and Windows, rather, sorry. Okay, the benefits of code generation. A lot of uh, things can be calculated and fixed up front rather than being recalculated a lot during the simulation. Uh, so that saves a little bit of performance. Um, also, the, uh, the user only has to deal with uh, defining the important things, like neural models, synapse models. You don't have to worry about how much memory should be used. Or uh, they, uh, Another good thing is that the code is automatically op optimized for the given uh, given hardware that the user's using and the network configuration that they're using. Okay, so I'm going to go on to showing you just a tutorial of how you might define uh, a simple network. So first, you might define your neural models. So uh, you would first define your uh, variables of your neural model, uh, your the type of your variable, so either a real number or a, uh, an integer, etc and you would define your parameters. And your simulation code for your model neuron would be defined as a C++ string. And, uh, and also the threshold condition, which is uh, the, fres uh, the condition which must be met for a spike to be propagated. Okay, you also define uh, uh, your pre-synapse model. So uh, for example, I've, uh, implemented a simple graded synapse model here, but you can also do regular uh, pulse-coupled synapses, STB, spike time independent plasticity rules, etc. Again, similar, you would define your, uh, your variables, uh, the type of your variable, real number, integer, etc. Uh, your parameters for your variable and your sim code as a string. And finally, you define your post-synapse models. So post-synaptic model is how spikes are converted into in in input current to the post-synaptic neuron. So again, you define variables, types, uh, parameters, and the simulation code is a string. Now, Gen comes with uh, a number of predefined models, uh, which you can use, such as Chubb-Miles, Hodgkin-Huxley, uh, Possum process, uh, graded synapses, spike time-independent plasticity 
or you can define your own so it's quite flexible. Um, Okay, once you define your models, you now connect everything uh, together. So you would use a, a function, you would define a function, model definition. Inside, you would define your model name as a string, uh, your integration step size, dt. And after that, you add your neuron populations. So you would give it a, a neuron population, a name, uh, a number of neurons in a population, and the model which you defined earlier of the neuron population. And once you define your neuron population, you define your synapse populations. Synapse populations take a name, the in-group or the out-group. They take the presynaptic model defined earlier, and they take a postsynaptic uh, model defined earlier. And we also have uh, synaptic delays as well. Uh, parameters are passed in the form of arrays and C++ vectors. Okay, so the idea of gen is that it's very minimal, it's very bare bones. It's gen only defines the functions which simulate a single step time and copy the data to and from the device. Everything else is left to the user. So the user would, could do such things as def uh, define input patterns, define uh, conductance matrices. Uh, you would save, uh, analyze the data online perhaps, and um, maybe even pipe the output into another process. It's very uh, minimal, it's very flexible. And then you would use the gen generated functions to first copy your data to the accelerated device. Uh, use time step GPU to uh, integrate a single time step of the simulation, uh, as opposed to a lot of other simulation software where you would uh, say integrate your simulation for 10 seconds or such, and it wouldn't stop until those 10 seconds are finished. Here you get a lot more control. You can integrate a single step size, and if you wanted, you can uh, copy the data or do whatever you want after a single iteration, so it gives you a bit more flexibility. And after that, as required, you, can, uh, you copy the data back to the host. Okay, so we give a, a few uh, connectivity options. So. Uh, Usually, uh, synapses, conductance matrices, they're represented as a, a two-dimensional matrix. They're actually represented as a one-dimensional matrix, which is a two-dimensional flattened. But, uh, so typically, you'd have a dense representation where per presynaptic neuron, you have all connections to postsynaptic neuron, whether they exist or not. And this can be quite wasteful if within a synapse group there aren't many synapses. So we also offer a, uh, a sparse connectivity scene where uh, only the connections within the, uh, the synapse group are actually encoded. And at a, a small uh, performance hit for indexing this sparse array, but you could save a, a lot of memory uh, doing this way and be able to use a lot bigger models. Uh, there's also, uh, the sp um, you could change the way spikes are evaluated so if you get a, a synapse group which has a lot of uh, fanning in, uh, or a, a lot of fanning out rather, typically you would, um, the synapse, synapse kernel number of threads would be the number of postsynaptic neurons. However, if you have a lot of uh, uh, synapses which fan in from a presynaptic group, it can be more efficient to uh, parallelize over the presynaptic neuron group rather than the postsynaptic neuron group. A gen doesn't calculate these uh, settings automatically <coughs> yet, so it's up to the user to do a bit of, uh, do a bit of experimentation and uh, determine which settings work best. Okay, so just to uh, demonstrate uh, a few uh, of the capabilities of gen, there's a few benchmarks. Uh, this is a Isikovic pulse coupled neural network model. It's uh, a population of 80% excitatory, 20% inhibitory, 1,000 random connections in neuron, uh, random conductances and parameters, and random input for every neuron at every time a step. And this is the result. Now, the top graph is the throughput uh, in spikes, and this benchmark demonstrates. The bottom trace is the throughput of spikes. That's the number of spikes per second times 10 to the 6. And you see the CPU trace at the bottom 
stays pretty constant. In fact, it gets worse as the number of neurons increases. So I have a GPU. You, um, we have up to, in this particular simulation, 40 times 10 to the 6 uh, spikes uh, through per, uh, per second. So, so uh, that's, uh, the, the curve begins to trail off when the device is fully saturated. But um, you can see it's a lot more than the, the CPU implementation. OK, uh, so another place Gen really excels is when you have complicated neural models. In the previous example, you have a very uh, simplistic uh, Isikovich model neuron. However, if you were to use, say, a Chubb Miles Hodgkin Huxley neuron, you, get, uh, you can get real performance gains compared to a CPU implementation. So this model, it was developed by Thomas Novotny et al. It's a model of the inf insect olfaction. It uses Poisson process inputs and Chubb Miles Hod Hodgkin Huxley neurons. And here, again, we have throughput, which uh, the throughput of spikes, because it's not such an active uh, model as the uh, Isikovich, the throughput isn't so high. However, the simulation wall clock time is a lot higher than the CPU uh, implementation. The CPU implementation for a five second um, simulation time uh, is completed in 10 to the minus two seconds compared to, uh, sorry, no. Yeah, um, 10 to the minus two uh, seconds compared to a G uh, GPU simulation. This particular GPU does the same simulation. Sorry, I've really messed that up. The top trace is the CPU uh, implementation and that uh, does a five second simulation at 10 to the four seconds and the lower trace is the equivalent GPU simulation at uh, 10 to the minus two. So because the model is so complicated, because it's computationally expensive. GPUs really excel here. OK, uh, so gen can be used as is, standalone, via the command line. Uh, that's bash for OS X and Linux. Or it can be used uh, as part of a, uh, a bigger simulation package. So we have a backend. Uh, we're a backend to the spine creator uh, G, um, GUI package neural network GBI package. And we also have a, uh, um, an interface to the Brian2 interface for Python, uh, thanks to uh, Dan Goodman and uh, Marcel Stinberg. OK, uh, some work in progress. We will soon have a, an OpenCL implementation. Right now, Gen only has a CUDA implementation, so we're limited to using, <coughs> excuse me, NVIDIA GPUs. Um, however, with an OpenCL implementation, we'll be able to have, uh, uh, we'll be able to use AMD devices, Intel devices such as the Xeon Fi chip, and uh, even FPG, uh, FPGAs. Uh, we'll soon have multi GPU support with load balancing, such that neural networks that are uh, neurons that are nearby within the model will be nearby in the hardware topologically. Uh, and also, um, neuro, um, all numerical simulations have a certain amount of error, and these errors have uh, strange interactions in parallel hardware. So I'll, um, as part of my work, I'll be investigating the neural uh, numerical error of um, simulations on GPUs, as well as the error introduced from the inter um, integration method. OK. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Marcel Stimberg and Dan Goodman for the uh, Brian2 interface, uh, Alex Cape for the SpineML interface, and uh, Alan, Cope, uh, Alan Diamond rather, for his help testing and his uh, neuromorphic classification algorithm added to Gen. Uh, our project is available at uh, github.com slash genteam slash gen, and we're under active, de active development and always looking for suggestions and help questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, James. <laughs> Nervous PhD student. Uh, you did just perfectly. Uh, questions for James? One here, I think. 
My worry is that models then don't have much interoperability. So I'm wondering how, in gen, if two independent people create models that they then want to link, how would that work? Is there a pipeline for that? Yeah, so to get completely reproducible simulations on parallel hardware, you'd have to serialize some of the parallelized uh, instructions. That's the only way you can get um, completely comparable. But uh, some of the work I'm hoping to do is um, upper and lower error bounds. So Two runs of the same simulation on parallel hardware should be within uh, very tight bounds. But obviously, you can't, without serializing instructions, can't get completely reproducible results. However, you can get very close. So, yeah. There's a question over there. It is wonderful to see a GPU can give a high efficiency for simulation. But I wonder whether it is because of this uh, connectivity, like uh, here you apply all to all connections. It means quite homogeneous. Uh, but as we know, it, uh, for the neuron connections, it's not all to all. Normally, it's uh, based on different uh, facts, like a special or other facts. It uh, causes large uh, heterogeneous. In that case, it might take a long time for uh, to communicate between different cells of the GPU. Uh, in that case, to consider the, 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 the real, real case, whether it is uh, still, I mean, uh, to apply a GPU, whether it is still high efficient, maybe in that case it's uh, more or less the same as the CPU. I wonder what is your opinion? Uh. So there is still uh, a performance advantage to be had over the, um, it is, um, I mean, do I have the figure? I don't actually have the, uh, so uh, in the Isigovich model, uh, there's, I believe these were sparse synapses. So again, um, as you said, um, no, we don't use uh, all to all a lot of the time, but even if we do use the sparse implementation, there's still a, a considerable performance advantage over using uh, CPUs, especially if, uh, when larger models are concerned. Um, I don't hope that answered that. Sorry. I think we're going to have to stop now. There are opportunities for more questions in the round table.